doing today? We're good. Good. Can you can you imagine the cold that came in today? Yeah. Uh, before you start the video, I'd like to say these words. The little things that you do in this video is what will make the difference. So make sure that when you take them into your room that you lead them into your room. That means that from the elevator or wherever you're at, you take the lead and enter and lead them into your room. But once you get at the door of your room, you should not enter the room before they do. You should stop and basically wave them into your room as you're assisting them. You know, I actually had to, uh, you know, I got the garden out here, yeah. and so I actually had to uh, get up this morning at 5 o'clock in the morning and be over here watering the garden. Wow. But I just looked at it right before you guys walked in. I looked at it. It looks like it's going to make it, so it's well worth it. I had probably 25 hours of planting in that thing. Wow. So, so hopefully, frosting, get anything. frosting yeah. doesn't look like it. I'm yeah. going to get out there later on today, so hopefully uh, the uh, weather is behind us for the spring. Yeah. But we'll see. We'll see. Okay, well, let me explain what we're going to do today. Uh, we actually have two goals today that we're going to accomplish. Uh, goal number one is we're going to do a cash flow analysis. Now, the cash flow analysis, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find your hurdle rate. So we're really, if you remember what the hurdle rate is, it's what rate of return do you need on your money in order to never run out of money. Now, what you're seeing here is, the one thing I also want to mention is, is that when you led them into your room, you should not sit down until they are both seated. It's very important. That's just a respect. Now, if you're looking at the video, if you see how I'm leaning forward a little bit, I'm not leaning forward a lot. I am leaning forward a little bit. What this does is by us leaning forward a little bit, we are engaging our prospect, our future clients, to lean forward a little bit. What this does is it gets them involved. So make sure that you lean forward in your desk. And right now I don't have any idea of what I'm going to recommend from a standpoint of portfolio because what happens is if your hurdle rate is a 4% rate of return, that requires a different portfolio than if you're a 6% rate of return. And you know, Ann, last time you had a question like, are they okay? You asked that question. Well, let me tell you how you can feel that on the, well, when we do this uh, cash flow. If you need a 10% rate of return every year for the rest of your life to make sure you don't run out of money, you are not okay. Okay, so it really comes down to are you okay? It all comes down to what the rate of return is that you need. So a 4% hurdle rate deems a different than a 6 or an 8% hurdle rate. So that's the first thing we're going to do. And the second part, what we're going to do is we're going to show you how we manage money. Okay. So we're going to show you, you know, you guys, I think uh, last time, Jamie, you asked about our exit strategy. Yes, we're going to go is. through our exit strategy and, and talk about that. Very important. It, it, well, you're going to find out how important it is. I've, I've sort of looked at your situation already since the last time we met. So that's, uh, you're going to find out how important it is. Okay. So now do you guys have any questions from the last meeting? I think we're okay. I think we're good. We're anxious to hear what you have to say. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started then. This here is the cash flow we're going to fill out. Now, you can see that I'm turning the screen towards them. Make sure that your clients can see the screen. I have sat down with people before when they're doing their presentation that the clients can't even see the screen. They can see the screen better than the client. So let's make sure that the clients can see the screen. Now, there's two rules I have when I do this. Rule number one, this is your spreadsheet, not mine. I have my own for my own family. Now, what I mean by that is if there's anything on here, once you understand how it works, that you would like to change or adjust, feel free to do so because this is your spreadsheet, not mine. Excellent. The second rule I have is there are going to be some assumptions we're going to have to uh, have to make, some assumptions we're going to have to assume, right? And if we have to make those assumptions, I would rather err on the side of conservative if that's okay with you. Because yeah. what I want to do is, worst case scenario, we have more money, okay? I'd rather not the other way around. Sure. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain every column, and we'll fill them in together. I, I sort of looked at this, but I, I always like doing this together because you'll understand the spreadsheet better. So here in column B, as you see, uh, we have 55. So that is the age of Anne. Now, Jim, you're 57, Anne's 55. We always put the youngest person in there. 
And the reason we put the youngest person in there, because we want the money to last as long as the youngest person. Sure. It makes sense, right? That's important to me. <laughs> Since you're the youngest person. Right. And it's important to me, too, that she doesn't run out of money. Well, good. So. Good. In this column, column C, this is where we put down your non-IRA money. Now, this is money that, you know, the reason we separate them, you'll find out we separated them into two columns. One's your non-IRA money, the other one's your IRA money. And the reason we separate those is because your IRA money, when we go pull money from that, we're paying taxes. But your non-IRA money, when we make money on it, we pay taxes, but when we pull it out, we don't pay taxes. Okay? So if you look at what you had, you actually had two pots of money in there. One was the $37,000 that you had for your emergency fund. Mm -hmm. And the other one that you had was the $115,000 for at Fidelity, your joint account. Well, I'm not going to include the $37,000. The $37,000 is more of an emergency fund. What I'm really doing an example here is I want to look and see how your retirement works. So I'm not going to include that emergency fund. So let's go ahead and put $115,000 in there. Now, what you'll see here is you see this 4% up here? We call it the return on investment. That 4% is basically, another name is your rate of return okay. or your hurdle rate. Okay. Now, the reason I bring that up now is because here in column D, you see I have $115,000 in column C. When you make 4%, you're going to make $4,600 on that 115. dollars Understood? Okay. Yeah. Now, if I change this to 5%, you can see it just right on the fly to $5,750. Okay. So I'm going to go back to 4%. One of the reasons why I start off at 4%, and you'll, I think you'll see it here, I want you to feel on how the spreadsheet works. Okay. You know, I could put a number down there to begin with that I know is going to work, but you're not going to fully understand it. Okay. okay? So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to jump all the way over here to IRAs. That's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, Jim, in your Fidelity account, in your IRA, you have $352,000. Correct? Correct? Yes. Yeah. And Anne, your number is four hundred eighty-four thousand one hundred seventy-seven dollars. That's correct. Correct. And then Jim, in your four hundred one k, you have sixty-seven thousand. Correct. Okay. So you have a total of nine hundred three thousand dollars. Okay. Right. Now the one thing I have to add in here, because correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe what the goal was is that. When Jim hits 66, in the year that you would hit 66, which is a little bit over eight years from now, you want to be able to retire. Yes. And the only money that we're saving now is you have a 401k where they're doing a dollar for dollar match mm -hmm. up to 6%. Correct. Okay, so let me show you what I'm going to put in here. I'm going to go over here in this column and I'm going to put down that you're making $150,000 and I'm going to multiply that by 0.12. And let me explain why we're doing 0.12. 6% is your money, and 6% is a contribution. Yes. Okay? So a total of 12%. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to copy, and I'm going to paste that down for eight years. Make sure I got that right. Yep, I got it for eight years. And I'm going to go one more year, actually, because... You're 57, we want to retire you when you're 66. Okay, so there we go. So what it looks like is, and let me sort of explain this here. If you were able to get a 4% rate of return on your money, mm -hmm. and you put in 6% of your income, that when you retire, you're going to have somewhere around $1.4 million. So you remember the old uh, Fidelity commercials? The Fidelity commercials, the guy's walking around the street with that in his hand? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the number you need to walk around okay. with. That's your goal if All we right. get you there. Okay, now what we have to do, if we have to put in your cost of living. So your cost of living, one thing that we went over is, is that you have your house that is, uh, you owe about $110,000 on that is at 3.2%. Correct. And you know, one thing that you had asked me last time was, should we take our Fidelity account and pay that off? One thing I would tell you about is, is to read the book, Getting Naked. Now the reason is, is that you hear me during this, this appointment that I'm giving a lot of advice to them. That's why the clients are with us. We want solid advice to be given to the clients. Continue to do that and be an advocate for them. You have seven more years. You know, 
right now, I don't believe I would do that. I mean, 3.2% is a good interest rate. Okay. And so and, and you can pay that off at any time. Right. But while you're working, at least you can get that tax deduction. And, and really what you're looking at is we have to start you on a glide slope. Right now, you've got eight years before you're glide sloping down to retirement. Mm -hmm. So since your house is going to be paid for, then you're on that glide slope. If, if something happens earlier, we can always grab that Fidelity account. But for now, I think I would just continue to pay that as you're going. It'll be paid off before you retire. Okay. Okay. So, um, so if you looked at it, what we said was is that you needed a cost of living of about $7,500 a month if your house was paid for. Now, I asked you sort of to double check. Is that still a good number? Yeah. That's, I think that's, we decided yeah. that... Yeah, that's good. That was a good number. So $7,500. Yeah. Okay. If you, if you see this, I'm getting a lot of little yeses from my prospects all during this appointment. What they say is that you have to get at least five yeses from the prospect before you can ask for them to become a client. So make sure that you get the little yeses. When you ask them something, make sure that they confirm and you get the little yeses. Now, that's what you need. Let's talk about the income streams. Your income streams, you have no pensions. No. So really what you're going to have is Social Security. Correct. Now, Social Security is a little tricky here, so follow me. All right. Jim, we know what yours is. Yours is going to be $2,500 a month when you're 66. Okay. So I'm going to put that in here. So I'm going to put 2,500 times 12. Now, Anne... You put seven. You worked seventeen years as a, a electrical engineer. Yes. You'll be eligible for either half of Jim's, or all of yours, when, when you're eligible. Okay. So, I'm not. We we couldn't find your social security statement. So I what I'm going to assume is that you're going to pull half of Jim's. Okay. So when he retires and you're sixty six, you'll be sixty four. And you'll be able to pull half the hits. Unless mine turns Unless out to be higher. more. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess, I guess remember I talked about the assumptions? Yeah. And, it, and, and since we didn't have that number, I'm going to assume the worst case scenario. I know that you'll get half the hits. Okay. And yours may be higher because, you know, you still may go back to work or you may have, you know, do something. So let me explain how that works. Jim's would be 2500 but we're going to multiply it by a half. Right, half of his. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to multiply it by 12. Now, the other little unknown thing is if you were both born on the exact same day, then yours would be exactly half of his. But since you're two years younger, yours is going to be reduced some. Yours is going to actually be reduced by about 13%. So you're not going to receive exactly half of his. You're going to receive half of his after it's been reduced 13%. Okay? Okay. Just trust me on that one. So I'm going to give you, basically what we do is we give you 87% of his. Okay, so that means your Social Security is going to be $43,000 is roughly what you would get when you're 66. Okay? Sounds good. And, you know, to talk a little bit about Social Security, and I know last time you guys brought up about you were worried about Social Security. If you look back on Social Security and what they've done historically, any times that they've changed Social Security, it's for people who are 55 years and younger. So really, from that standpoint, I feel pretty good at putting those numbers in here. And if you understand why the government does that, the reason they do that is because if you're under 55, you have time to adapt to any changes that they made. Okay. So therefore, I feel pretty comfortable that uh, at, at, you know, since you're both 55 or older, I think those numbers would be good. So we can look at that. So let's look at what happens. Oh, there was one more thing. You wanted money for travel, didn't you? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think 15, we talked about 15,000 a year. 15,000. Okay. When you're building their, this spreadsheet, the estate calc, make sure you understand that you're building their dream sheet. Make sure that it makes them feel good. What you want to do here is, is you want to be on their side and you want them to know that you're the one that can make their dreams come true by keeping them to adhering to this spreadsheet. Don't tell your clients that they can't do this and can't do that. See what they can do and, you know, sort of appease them or make sure that they, uh, they get their dreams out so they can, you know, do what they want to. 
So 15,000. Let me explain why I split that off the side. I put that actually in two columns. Your cost of living that you talked about, the $7,500 a month, mm -hmm. that's going to be with you forever. That's not that we call that, that is non discretionary money. You need to spend that money gotcha. to live. The 15,000, that is not a need, that's a want. Yes. So we sort of separate that out. And that's why I'm putting it in the other column. Okay. The other thing that I do, and, and, and this is another assumption, but I've been doing this long enough that I've seen it. I'm not going to let you travel or put $15,000 in there forever. And let me explain that one. Generally what happens, and you might have seen this with your, your parents. They're, they retire and they start traveling and stuff. But by the time they get later in their 70s or their early 80s, mm -hmm. mainly in their later 70s, one of two things has hap have happened. You either have seen everything you wanted to see, or as my dad used to say, you're get up and go, got up and went. Yeah. So the $15,000 that we put in here for travel, I'm going to put it in there until and until you're 80. Okay. Okay, and I know that you have a grandmother who's what, 95, 4? Uh, actually, she'll be 96 this year. 96. Wow. So, you know, one of the things we have to take into consideration, that's why I wanted you at this meeting. I know, Jim, you came to the first meeting and Ann didn't. But the reason is it's very important for you to understand this because, you know, we don't like to, if we look at it actuarially speaking, you know, she's going to be holding a checkbook for 10 to 14 years. Yes. So it's important that we make sure the money lasts as long as she does. Okay, so let me show you basically what how, on how this works, okay? You need $90,000 to live on. That's what you wanted, $7,500 a month. But you also wanted $15,000 for travel. So your total expenditure in one year is $105,000, okay. okay? Now, what happens is we also have the taxes that we owe, which is about three to begin with. It's a small amount, and I'll show you, I'm going to jump down and show you where it gets big. So that's basically $105,000, uh, $108,000. You get $43,000 coming in from Social Security. So if you need $108,000 minus $43,000, you need $65,000 from your investments. Okay, well, if you earn a 4% rate of return, and let me show you a couple moving parts in here. You see how we start off at $90,000? Yes. And you see what's happening every year? It's going up. Now, why is that, Ann? Um, why would this be going up? For inflation? Yes. What we want to do is, you know, talking, speaking about your grandmother going to be 96, mm -hmm. think about that. This is... We're talking 33 years later. Let me tell you, her loaf of bread today costs a lot more than it did back when she was 63. So we want to make sure they're keeping you up to the same purchasing power. Okay. Okay? So that's why it keeps going up. So here's a graph. If you look at it, this goes on forever. So if you earn a 4% rate of return on your money, what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph what your assets look like. Oh. That doesn't look good, Jim. No. Is that 88? Yeah, that is 88. So let me sort of explain and, and walk you down here. You're accumulating right now through these years. You see it? You're going up. Mm -hmm. And then you hit here, and you actually spend, start spending your money. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you. I'm going to backtrack. You know, um, uh, I actually I, I can thank one of my clients for this, but I showed her. It actually wasn't this. It'll, it'll be what we get to. But she always says, can you, can you, I don't understand it. Can you show me from a big number standpoint? Well, I told you you needed $65,000 a year, right? Correct. Well, I told you you have $1.4 million. Well, 4% of $1.4 million is $56,000. If you need sixty-five, dollars we're going down by $9,000 the first year. Sure. And so you're going in the wrong direction. Yeah. So what do we do? We need to tweak up your hurdle rate. We need to get you to a higher hurdle rate. Well, or if we need to, we, maybe we can back off that travel a little bit. Yeah, that How might. What would happen if we took that out? Well, let's well, look at the 5%. Let's okay. look at what the travel. Right. Okay. Now, one of the things on the spreadsheet that you must do is you make sure that they need you. And what I mean by that is people who have a 5% to 65 or 7% hurdle rate, they are they are ideal prospects or clients for us. And the reason that they are is because they need to be invested, 
but they cannot go through a bear market. So, you know, somehow if it's five to six and a half percent hurdle rate, that is a very good rate of return for us, and those are the people that we can help the most. So the five percent. Okay, now we're almost to 100. Yeah, yeah but that's you, looking yeah. better. Okay. Now, you know we can make this do whatever we want to. Sure. Yeah, I'm not sure that I want it much higher than that, though, because... Um, Let's try five and a half. Okay. Okay. That looks good. Five and a half. How do you feel about five and a half today? Well, actually, I was going to ask you that. Okay. I was going to ask it from a standpoint of five and a half percent. I mean, what you can see here, if you, you know, read this, this is basically five and a half percent. That means out here, Ann, when you're 97, you still have $1.2 million left. That would feel good. Yeah, I'm, I, I mean, that looks good. The question is, is can we really get five and a half percent on our money consistently? my question as well. So let me ask you a question. And I know you guys have been, you know, Jim, I see that you've been in the S&P you know, with your with it and stuff. And, and this is a little different because what we have here is we have Jim that's 100% in the S&P. Yeah. And then when Ann, you've pulled your money out because you're afraid of the market right now. Well, I'm probably a little more conservative than, than Jim. You're 100% in cash. That is very conservative. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, let me ask you a question. That's because I'm living longer, Eli. Okay, I know, I know. Yeah. If, if you felt that you would never be in another bear market, how would you feel about getting 5.5%? Well, if we're never going to be in another bear market... Uh, Do you think it's doable it's, then? It's doable if you look at history. You know, in the S&P 500, uh, I, the research I've done says you can do more than 55 or certainly feel comfortable with that. But I don't know if history is going to repeat itself. So that's where I'm sitting here. We, you know, we get that question all the time. We get people asking us saying, but things are different now, right? right. Things are different. Feeling, yeah. Right. Uh, they're different. We got a different president. We mm -hmm. got different. And you know what's funny is if you look at what's different, it's always been different. It's all, I mean, if you go back on it, think about like the 20s. Have we did, in the, when we were going through the 20s, have we ever seen a depression like we were going through? Could we ever even imagine a depression? Then we got into World War II. Did we ever think we would be in such a, a great world war? Then we went in, then we saw, uh, uh, what did we have? We had a president that was shot on United States soil, right, mm -hmm. uh, in a parade. We never thought about that. We went into a war that we could never win in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You know, we had two buildings knocked down in, in New York City. It's always different. And you know what's funny is, is because it's always different, it's actually the same. So it's it's you know what we're about what we're going to go into in the next decade we've probably never seen before, which is always which actually the more it is different the more it actually stays the same. So what I'm going to do is in this stuff you know five, I'll tell you how I feel five and a half percent I'm fine with that. Well, I'm you fine do this with for it. a living. So yeah I know but I mean you know then again you could think I'm in sales but really you know I would I would tell you exactly what I thought you know now if that number was six and a half or seven I'd be on I'd be on your side. Okay. But at five and a half, I feel very, I feel very comfortable. Okay. Now, one thing you know, when we look back on this, you can see that we have about eight or nine years before you start needing the money. Mm -hmm. Now, I do have one guarantee that I d will deliver today, and it's on this spreadsheet. This spreadsheet, I guarantee you, is not what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you what's going to happen in the future, but I've been doing this way too long to know that that's going to be it. So what we have to do, what we do with our clients is, we come back annually and we find out how we're doing versus where we forecast it. So this spreadsheet that you saw, it's never going to change. So you meet with your clients annually? No, no. What we do is we meet with our clients every six months. Oh, wow. Okay, so we meet with our clients every six months, but at least annually we like to come back and revisit the spreadsheet. And what we do is we basically, if you look at it, you'll see over here on this uh, graph, You'll see this purple line down here. That purple line will come to life because this is where we started. And when we put in the numbers in another spreadsheet, that purple line will then say, well, how are we forecasting versus where we started? You know, as a electrical engineer, Ann, you know, you had your budgets. Correct. And then you also had how you were doing actually versus your budgets. That's the same thing here. Our actual cost of our, performing versus yeah. our budget. Uh -huh. That way we need to know of what we need to make any adjustments. Okay.
One thing that you'll see that I did here was I agreed with them. I am not combative with them during this part of the process. You know, when they ask questions, tell them, that was a good question. So you see that uh, I said that in here. I said, that was a good question, Ann. I actually like calling them by their first names because what they do is, is that it addresses them individually. So make sure that you say that was a good question. It makes them feel good and it makes them feel like they're being, you know, they're in the meeting with you. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is, I, and I feel comfortable with this. Let me go ahead and show you how we manage money. So can I ask you a couple questions about the spreadsheet? Yes. Um, so what's the longest length of time that you've had a client that you have a baseline versus a... Uh, um, some actual numbers. It's a good question. This spreadsheet looks very simple. This spreadsheet is extremely effective. And I'll let you know that I've been, I've been using this spreadsheet, the longest that I've been using this spreadsheet is probably about 14 years. Okay. I did one the other day, Ann, that was eight years old. And we were within 0.1% of where we thought we were going to be. Wow. It was unbelievable. So okay. good question because it's like it's only as good as, as its predictor. Mm -hmm. It is a very accurate measure of where we're going to be. Yeah, no, I was just trying to get a feel for yeah, how, how close, close you know, mm -hmm. people are working towards it. Okay, thank you. You said a couple. Another one, or are you good? No. Okay. So let's now um, go and talk about how we manage money. Big family. Thank you. That was at a Christmas. There's a uh, 38 people there. Wow. 38 people. Here are my in-laws. Mm -hmm. The guy with the Michigan. Yeah, that's yeah. that's my father-in-law. Yeah. Matter of fact, he just turned uh, 77 the other day. Wow. And then my mother-in-law. There's my mom there. Mm -hmm. So my mom will be 81 here in about three weeks. Matter of fact, we're going up and seeing her next week. Congratulations. So she's going to be 81. Mm -hmm. And then these are all the nieces and nephews and and everybody else up there. Okay, so when we manage money, let me talk about this. And, and, and one thing I want to talk about, and I want to bring up, you know, bring up points. You know, and you're sitting in in a lot of cash right now in your. Well, in because your, I wasn't sure really what to do with my investments, and, and I so guess that's part of the reason why we're here. Understood. And I, I don't want. I basically wanted to let you know what you have to understand is, and I know you're you're conservative, and you you want to protect yourself from living a long time. I know I got a stare there. You didn't know what I was saying. You want to protect yourself from not running out of money. Understood right. there. Right. But here, you know, if you're making 1% on your money being conservative, what you're really doing is you are guaranteeing yourself to do that. Yeah. You sort of see what I'm talking about? And, you know, I didn't know how this was going to come out. I had a rough idea. And there are certain people that when I sit down with them, I was like, I want them as a client. Mm -hmm. And the reason I want them is, is because I can really help them. One thing I've learned is tell them that you want them as a client. If you notice what I just did here, I told them that they were ideal clients for us. People want to feel like we are a perfect match. And what happens here is, is that I asked him here that I said, this is why you're the ideal client and that we want you as a client. People like to feel wanted. And so what I'm about to get into is after I, when I look at this, I feel like we're a match. And the reason we're a match, you know, if somebody has a hurdle rate of 3%, they don't need us. Right. Okay. When you need a hurdle rate of 5.5%, you have to be invested, but you have to have a safety net. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm going to show you. First of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to correct your graph because I know you don't like it uh, no. being like that. So let's make it look pretty again. There you go. Okay. Okay. So, you everyone knows that our firm is very well known as buy, hold, and sell. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me first look at this from thirty-five thousand feet, looking down. We have two teams. We have an offensive team and we have a defensive team. Okay. For your offensive team, that's what we do when we're in the market. What portfolio should the crocheters be in? when we're in the market, okay? I'm gonna recommend that you be in a 60% stock and a 40% bond. Let me explain why. We wanna take as least risk in order to get our hurdle rate. Your hurdle rate is 
Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to get 5.5%. It doesn't mean that we're going to strive to only get 5.5%. I mean, there are times in our 60-40 portfolio where we had over 20% in a year. Last year, we were up 13%. So the idea here is I have to look at history and see what will that portfolio get for you. And that's why it's a 60% stock and 40% bond. Matter of fact, Jim, you had that year 401k. Right, I've got that now. Yeah. Right? Now the problem I have with your with your IRA is you're 100% stock. Yeah, I, I just didn't know what to do. Well, you had a good, great year last year. Yeah, yeah okay. fun last year. So, if, if you're going to be in a 60% stock, 40% bond, that's when we're in the market. When we get out of the market, we go play defense. So I don't know what our defensive team's going to look like, but we follow three rules when we play defense. Rule number one, protect principle. Now, so if you understand, we believe we just had a nice bull run, we've had some good gains, so now we believe the market's going to go down. Mm -hmm. So if you get me out, protect principle. Rule number two, hopefully we can make some money, okay? We just don't, I mean, it's easy to protect principle, just go stick it underneath the mattress. But hopefully we can make some money when we're out of the market. And rule number three, never put rule number two ahead of rule number one. Good. Never put our money at risk trying to make more money when we believe the market's going down, okay? One thing you'll notice about my desk, it's clean and organized. I've had comments of people that said the reason they became clients from, uh, for me or to me was because my desk was neat and organized and that they actually said if, my, if I kept their investments the same way, that would mean that they felt very at ease. So just make sure that your desk is clean and organized. And then the last thing I want to describe about our defensive portfolio, if you're in a 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio. I may be in an 80% stock, 20% bond, 80-20 with my, my son, who's 24 years old, he has his Roth IRA 100% stock. That is his offensive team, mm -hmm. right? My mother may have a 40% stock, right. but when we get out of the market, we all go play defense at the same place. Okay. It's when we go back in the market that we all go into our separate ways versus our risk tolerance. Okay, so the best way to talk about our defensive team is just to really tell you what we did and that way you'll understand what we were doing. Okay, so the first time that the trigger, and when, let me explain what you see here. This is the S&P 500. Now, why do we use the S&P 500? The S&P 500 has the top 500 companies uh, in the United States by market capitalization. It actually encapsules 85% of the total market. So it is a big volume uh, to look at. Uh, why do we use the S&P and not use China? We have some people say, why don't you use China? Well, actually, if you look at the volume that trades in the S&P 500, uh, from a dollar standpoint, it trades more in one day than the next 13 combined stock markets across the world. Oh, wow. We are the big gorilla. So what do you have here? This is this S&P, and this is actually going back to about 1999. So the market ran up and hit a high point. If you remember back then, it used to be called the dot-coms. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then from 2000 here, all the way down, you see it going down until 2002. You see this little dip here? That's 9-11. Okay. To 2002, that was a 49% drop. Wow. Now, what happened then was the market came all the way back up here and got back and had a 100% gain. So the market had a 100% gain, but it only got you back to where you were. Yeah. Okay? Now, let me, I better go back over that again. I said that this went down 49%, and the market went up 100%, and you're back to where you were. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you understand that? Go ahead and it for me, though. Let me show you what I mean by that. Let's say that you had... Listen, you got a million dollars, right? Okay, let's say you have a million dollars right now. And let's say between now and eight years from now, you're able to grow that to $2 million. Now, one thing I just did that you saw, I anchored the concept. So it was an important concept. The idea here is what we call by anchoring is, is when you throw out, say, you know, I will uh, rebalance for you. Is that important to you? Don't let that hang out there. Ask the question, is that important to you? 
Would you allow me to do that for you? When you anchor them, they are agreeing once again to the yeses and they're moving along in the process. Okay? And you're a math person and engineer. If you lost 50% and stayed in the market, how much money would you have after that? If you lost 50%? Well, I'm, I'm back down to my million dollars. Mm -hmm. But now, like you, let's say that you stayed in there, buy and hold, you never got out, and the market went back up 50%. How much money do you have? No, I'm not. I'm back to one and a half. Right. The important things to understand here is that a 50% decrease is not made up with a 50% increase. Or a 50% increase does not make up a 50% decrease. You actually have to gain 100% to get back to where you were. Wow. Well, then what happened here in 2007, you started going down again, remember the subprime? And then you hit the Wiley Coyote Cliff here in the fall of 2008, and we hit a low point here in March of 2009. Now this, Peak to Valley was a drop of 57%. Second worst bear market we've ever had. And then if you bought and held, well, guess what? You're now back up to, all the way back up to where we're at today. So, you know, this is a good point. What do you think the market's return has been over the last 14 years? This is from July of 99 through today in 2014. What was the, what do you think that if you put $100 in, how much would you have today? Well... It looks like we'd only be up maybe 20 percent, Jim. Okay. Well, you're the math uh, person. 30 percent. 30 percent. You weren't far off. 30 percent divided by 14 years. That's a little bit over 2 percent a year. Now, how do you feel about putting down that you're going to average 5.5 percent for the rest of your life on that spreadsheet? I don't know if that feels good now, does it? No. No, we're not feeling good. Uh, it, 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 but it's, it, and you know what's weird about it? <laughs> You're up 30%, but this right here, this was a 100% gain in the market, and this was a 175% gain. So you had 275% gains in the market, but you're only up 30% because of those downside. Wow. So where I was going to with this, but I want to sort of get the base with this for you, is I was talking about defensively. In this graph, the first time the trigger hit, was here in October of 2000. Uh, back then, money market for a defensive team. Why? Money markets were paying 6%. Yeah. Rule number one, protecting our principal. Sure. Rule number two, we're making money. Right. Also wrap this back around, what's your hurdle rate? Five, Five and, a half. and a half. And we're getting six, so we're winning. Next time we triggered, here in November of 2007, money market. Money markets were paying about 5.2, mm -hmm. okay? So we triggered there. Next time we triggered, or another, this right here in 2011. Now 2011, I know you're thinking, it sounds like money markets every time, it's not money markets. 2011, 11, money markets were paying about 1%. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we stuck our clients half in money markets and half in short-term bonds. Okay. We were out of the market for about six months and we made about 2% during that time. So in hindsight, we were very happy with playing defensive, mm -hmm. uh, our defensive team. So do you, you sort of get the feel about how we play defense? I do. I don't know where we're going to go, but I know we're going to follow our three rules. Okay. Okay? So now let's talk about the offensive team. When we play offense, we do two things. Okay? Rule number one, we diversify your portfolio. Now one thing that you just saw that I did here, I placed the chart so that they could see it. And if you notice, I sort of moved it across the table to them. Now, if you just saw what Ann did, Ann grabbed it and she pulled it closer to her. I won. That's what you need to do. When you present the eye chart or the portfolio sheet, you have to get them to pull it towards them. As a matter of fact, if you push it there and they aren't engaged in pulling it towards them, I would say that you should push it towards them again within the next 15 or 20 seconds because as soon as they grab it and moved it a little closer, now they are actually still engaged in the process. Rule number two, we rebalance your portfolio. So let me talk about rule number one, uh, diversification. Actually, this right here, this is a 60% stock and a 40% bond account. This is what you thought we would be in. 
Yeah, okay. yeah. This is what I would recommend. Okay. It, it's you know, it's it reminds me. It's like you know, like uh, the the three bears. It's not too risky. It's not too conservative. It's just right. And I think what you're going to find out, and what my goal is, I, you know, Jim, with your 100% stock, right. we need to back that down. Sure. Okay, you know, and you say, well, I'm getting the, the highest, re, you know, returns and stuff. Well, what I would tell you there, if you want the highest returns, let's go cash all that money in, put it in a suitcase, get on a flight to Vegas, and as soon as we get off, let's buy it, a bet it all in black. Because that's where your highest returns are going to be. Sure. But the reason we don't do that is because of risk. Right. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get to the returns you need without taking too much risk. Okay. On the other side of things, with you, Ann, what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you that with our exit strategy on how we can put you in a 60-40 portfolio with our exit strategy and you can sleep at night. Okay. Because okay, I understand uh, from the standpoint of your conservativeness and, and what your concerns are. I just want to show you why. Okay? So... Rule number one, diversification. So if you look at this 60%, we put about 41% in U.S. stock, about 19% in international stocks. Now, in the U.S. stock market, we use about 18% in what they call large cap value. So let me explain what large cap value is. That is what they call a large market capitalization, fancy word. But basically, it's larger revenue companies. And when they make money... They don't, they don't put it back in the company so much as they do as they give it back to you as dividends. So these would be companies like ExxonMobil, Procter & Gamble, Verizon. Okay, they pay a very nice dividend. Mm -hmm. Large cap growth. Now, and you probably know about large cap growth because these are more of your, could be your technology companies. When they make money, what they do is they pour it back in the company to try to grow their stock. Okay, so you know a lot of them like the like the Googles and and those companies are large growth. One I always bring up uh, one sector is the healthcare, the pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. Okay, what are the pharmaceutical companies doing? What they're doing is they're taking their profits and they're putting so money back in R and D trying to find that cure for cancer. Sure. Okay, small value. I know small revenue paying good dividends, not necessarily expanding. Okay. Very uh, little niche area here, but let me give you an example. Victoria's Secrets. Victoria's Secrets is not going to double their uh, business next year, but they have a very good little niche market where they make a very good profit. Mm -hmm. Small growth. Most companies actually start off as small growth companies. You know, what are they? What's the starting out of a garage? I guess mm -hmm. if the, the latest one. All, all these companies starting out of a garage. So it's small growth. What do they do? They're just uh, starting off and they're blowing it going and putting the money back in their business. Mm -hmm. International stocks. We have two different international stocks. One's the international equities. Now, the international equities, those are the well-established international countries. Okay, Those would be like the Japans, Germany's, the Englands of the world. They have a very good regulatory system. You can trust their banking system. Okay, We have this one over here called emerging markets. Now, emerging markets are interesting. You know, We talk about where's the growth in the future. You know, it's actually a lot of it's in emerging markets. Emerging markets it holds about 80% of the world's population. Now, you're noticing that I'm using a pen a lot. I actually like to use a pen during my presentation. And the reason it says is when you use a pen and you're pointing, it says, look here, focus here. So this is something that I like to do by using the pen. And that's why I do it, because I have their attention and they're focusing right to here. 80% of the world's population. Matter of fact, I'll give you a trivia question right now on that one. How many countries in the United States, or how many uh, cities in the United States have a million, a million people in them in the city proper? How many would you guess, Jim? Maybe 30%? No, no, total number, like one through 50. How many in city I proper? I that many. I'm really? guessing Small. maybe uh, 15 or? Nine. Oh, wow, that was way off. We, we know New York, L.A., mm -hmm. uh, we know Chicago, right. okay, here in Dallas, or Texas, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, yeah. Philadelphia, Atlanta, I forget, but there's a total of nine. Mm -hmm. How many cities in China have a million people or more in city proper? Just oh, a lot, based on the population, yeah, right? Very, very I mean, 157. So the countries that fit into that, Brazil, Russia, India, China, those are the big ones, but there's actually a total of 49 countries that are actually, you know, if we could figure out
how to sell in more hamburgers, McDonald's is going to be rich. Sure. Okay? Now, in the bond area, the bond area, there's actually four different areas in the bonds. One is called the core fixed income. This is basically is, is U.S. Treasuries. So a lot of it's going to be backed by the good faith of uh, the United States, U.S. We also put some money in what they call corporate bonds. Uh, and used to work at Texas Instruments. Uh, when they wanted to do a new splash room, they could either uh, float stock, take a loan, or they could do a bond. So that this is putting money in United States uh, bonds, corporate bonds. We also put about 2% into well-established international countries, and we put about 4% into the emerging markets. So rule number one is to be properly diversified. Any questions on that? What's the red one? Red ones, we put about 1% in cash. Okay. Yeah, it's just a money market that we do. Okay. So for instance, if you look at where you're at, and you're 100% here, Correct. Jim, your 401k is actually set up like this, mm -hmm. but your IRA is all right here, 100%. Okay. And the reason I bring that up now is because the second thing that we do is we do something called rebalancing. Now, before I show you what rebalancing is, I want to show you why we do it. Okay. okay? Once again, I want to point out here that the placement of the calendar chart, did you, if you notice where I placed it and how I placed it, not just what, how I, where I placed it, but you know, when I laid it down, what I did is I laid it down like I was putting their meal in front of them. I laid it down nice and softly and it was a presentation. So make sure when you put the calendar chart or the eye chart out that what you're doing is you're presenting to them. So just don't lay it down and slide it, present it to them. So these are just the little things that'll make a big difference. Now what we've done is we've taken all these different asset classes here and we've given them a color. And we stacked them from least return to highest return. Okay. So you can see, and we've done this for a 20 year period. So you can see in 1990, international stocks was at the very bottom, they're mm -hmm. the gray area. You can see in 1991, they were also at the bottom. 1992, they're at the bottom. What do you think we should do with international equity? Sell it. Get rid of it, but you know what? That would have been wrong, because look what happened here in 1993. Now, most people would say, that's fine, but I remember you did me wrong for three years in a row. Right. But guess what? 1994 is on top again. Mm -hmm. So it's probably time to get back in. Right. Well, that would have been wrong, too, because then they came down here. Oh, wow. And then it came back up here. So I'm going to walk you through the grades. See the ups and downs? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to go through all the colors, so I'm not going through all 10 different asset classes, but I am going through two more. I'm going to go with the blues. Okay. Uh, the reason I'm doing the blues... It's the easiest color for me to see. Yeah. Okay, this small value. Yeah. So you can see the ups and downs. Looks like what we used to call a sine wave. Up and down, up and down. Now the last one I'm going to do is, we all remember the dot coms pretty good because it was, you know, they had a nice run up. Right. Dot coms were actually called large growth. Okay. So in 1992 and 93, the dot coms were down here, the large growths. But look what happened in 1994, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. That's a long time. Yeah. They had a five or six year run there. Then look what happened to them. Five, six years of being down. There's actually a couple trends if you look at this. Rule number one, today's winners will be tomorrow's losers. Today's losers will be tomorrow's winners. Mm -hmm. The second thing we don't know is, like these dot coms, they ran up here for one, two, three, four, five, six years, and they ran down here for five years. We don't know how long they're going to be up there. But we do know that the more that they're up there, the more their tendency is to come down. Sure. So what we do is we do, this is we do something called rebalancing. Now, we touched on this in the seminar, but I want to make sure that you understand this. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a very simplistic view of this. Let's say that you had $100 in stocks and $100 in bonds. You had $200 overall, you're just going to do a 50-50. Okay. At the end of the first year, your stocks do fantastic. They gain you $160. Bonds do terrible. They lose you 10%. So at the end of the first year, you have $160 in stocks and $90 in bonds. But you know what? All you looked at was the bottom line, and you had $250 in your account. You're like, guess what? We gained 25% last year. It's all good. It's all good. The problem is, is that you now have close to 70% of your assets on this side. 
And the reason that's bad is because that was this year's winners. That has the greatest chance of going down. Okay. You see? Yeah. That's normally what we would buy more of. Yes, of course right. it is. Yeah. You'd buy more of this side. Yeah. See, but, and then, you know, and I know you guys have been doing it with Fidelity, and Fidelity's a good company, okay? But they're not going to advise you as long as you're keeping your, I mean, they, they won't give you a lot of advice from a standpoint of, of true, I call it hardcore advice. Now I'm going to critique myself a little bit here because I'm actually in presentation mode. As I watched this, I didn't like what I saw here. You know, if you're trying to get a client, you're not making a presentation. A matter of fact, if, if the client ever stops you and says, is it okay if I ask a question, You've, you're losing. What you have to do is, you are not there to make a presentation. You're there to get a client. Uh, you need to get them asking you questions. If they're not asking you any questions, you're in presentation roads. Once again, one thing I want to remind you about here is, is you'll see me that I'm talking a little bit more to Ann than I am maybe to Jim. And the reason is, chances are the female is probably the final decision maker on whether they're going to become a client. So be cognizant of that fact and make sure that when you do a presentation, you do a presentation to both of them and do not just you know, address one but address both of them equally. Mm -hmm. What you really need to do. Yeah, they probably would tell you that's a good thing to do. Wouldn't that make sense that you should buy something that just gained you 60%? I'm not going to do that to you because actually after you see this chart, it's not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I know it's human nature. This is one of the reasons why people have us. Because you make emotional decisions. I don't make a single emotional decision about your money. I'm making straight analytical and what I believe is the best advice for you. Okay. Actually, what you do is you buy $35 of this side by selling $35 of that side, of the stocks. $35 is not an arbitrary number. That's the amount of money that you need to get you back to a 50-50 portfolio. Yeah. You see that? Mm -hmm. And if you really think about it, I'll put it in a, in, a, in a phrase that you'll actually like. We are buying low, mm -hmm. something that's low, mm -hmm. by selling something that high, that's high. Yeah. Which actually, if you think about what I do, what, you, what you want to do, I want to buy low and sell high. Mm -hmm. That's what this does. Okay. okay? Any questions on that, Ann? Um, no. Something you know, that we normally wouldn't feel comfortable doing, I think, because, you know. We're going to chase the winner. Right. We've always yeah. wanted to, ch you know, buy what's done well. So, but I understand. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Matter of fact, you know what's funny is when you look at this, you can actually uh, go back and see if you if it works. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about what we're doing here, you can go back and just say, what well, does this actually work? Well. To help you answer that question, okay. this is actually a study that was done. This was a study that was done. Now, if you think about what they did here, they took a thousand dollars and put it in small caps. They put a thousand dollars in an international, and they put a thousand dollars in the S and P. Yeah. And what they said was, let's go ahead and hold them in this um, in this A, or what we'll do in this on on column B is let's go back and periodically rebalance them and get them back to a third, a third, and third. Mm -hmm. And if you look down here, what you'll find out is, they did this for a 25-year period. What you'll find out is, is by rebalancing, you had 9% more money. More importantly, you had what they call 17%, it's about 17% less uh, volatility or standard deviation, which means they smoothed your ride out by almost 20%, and what they did was they gave you a higher return. Very important. Okay. Well, we've got to start doing that. Yeah, we, we haven't thought of that. That's One thing that we do is we rebalance our portfolio every quarter. Now, I'll, I'm gonna, we, throw, we do it about the fifth business day past the end of the quarter. Now, the reason I whip that out to you is because it's unemotional, it's on a schedule, and we do it no matter what's happening while, while we're in the market. Without okay. any input from us. Yes. Yeah, it's gonna, if, you, if you're going to do business with us, we understand how valuable it is. Now, you have to understand, I'd rather not do it. And the reason I'd rather not do it is, is because it costs me money, hmm. okay? But I know that how valuable it is from your asset returns, and by us doing it, what's going to end up happening is you're going to have more money. And if you have more money, we'll have more money. So do we get charged a fee for that? For that it's result? included in the price. Okay. But there is, you know, I can't say that there is no cost to it. There is a cost to it. There's a cost to everything. It's just a matter of whether it's included in, the price, in, the, in our cost. There is no separate fee in, okay?
for the answer. Okay, you know what we do is quite simple. It's not easy, you know, because we get our emotions involved. Actually, when we're in the market, that's what we do. We diversify our portfolio and we rebalance it. Now, wrapped all around this is our exit strategy. Okay, so let me go back to this graph, which is our exit strategy. I alluded to the fact that we got out of the market here, we triggered in October of 2000. Okay. Now that green line that I've never referenced, mm -hmm. you sort of see it and the green line? Yeah. That is actually, you see how it's a smoother ride, it looks like, you know, is actually something that's called a the 200 day moving average of the stock market. So let me explain what that is. Whatever happened today in the market gets added to the 200 day moving average. Whatever happened 200 days ago gets taken away. And so we divide it. It's actually a backward looking trend of the 200 day moving average, of the 200 days in the stock market. Okay. It looks up about 10% of the total, uh, uh, 10 months back of the total market. And you can see how it's smoothing. Yes. When we hit 5% below the 200 day moving average, 5% below when we close, you have an 83% chance that that's going to happen. That it's going to continue to go down? Yes. So let me say that again. When the stock market closes 5% below the 200 day moving average, you have an 83% chance it was going to, it's going to go down. That is why we trigger and we get out of stocks. And now, when do we actually get out? We get out, so I'll, give you, I'll use the example today. If we hit today 5% below, we will be out of the market the close of business tomorrow. That's fast. Okay? Now, here's how I'll reference that. You know, because we're looking at finances, but we have a lot of different things in our life that we can, you know, that look a lot like it. If you two were sitting on, in Galveston, and you're sitting down there with your family on the beach, and a meteorologist comes on TV and says, 83% chance that the, this hurricane's coming through your front door. What are you going to do? We're leaving, Jim. Board it up and get out. Because you know what? You can always come back and live for another day. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. We get out. Okay? And, you know, the easy thing is getting out. The tough thing is getting back in. Yeah. And, you know, one thing right now, and that you're seeing is you're out. You're trying to decide when to get back in, and I have, an, I have a great idea for that. So I'll share that with you after I show this. So when do we get back in? One thing you have to remember is, is that, you know, they are there in front of you because they have a problem. You know, one thing Ken always said was, everybody comes to the seminar for a reason. What you have to find out is, what is the reason? What is the, the problem that they have? You need to find the problem and solve it. And you sort of see what we have here with Jim and Ann. They have problems, and it's okay to say, here's what I feel your problem is, and let me show you the solution. Because then you feel that they feel that you're in line with them. It's when that the stock market, and you can see this right here in 2003, when the stock market hits 3% above the 200 day moving average. Now why? When we hit 3% above the 200 day moving average, we have a 90% chance that the market's going to go up. So those are the two odds that we play. 83% on the down, 90% on the up. So it's just math for you. Everything's math for me. Wow. It's just it's it's an analytical statistical model that we use. And then if you look at it, right here in November of 07, we hit 5% below. Mm -hmm. We got out. Back here in June of 09, we hit 3% above, and we get back in. Mm -hmm. Now, you're probably thinking, wow, that's fantastic. Why isn't everyone doing this? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, you have to have you have to have, be able to do it from a standpoint of getting everybody out. We have a system set up where we're able to do that. We have our own investments where we're allowed to do that. The Securities Exchange Commission has allowed us to do that. Okay. Also here, I wanted to show you, it sounds great, right? But we do have warts. Okay, so let me show you the warts so you fully understand. You see this in here in 2011? Yes. Okay. And remember what I said, I said 83%. I didn't say 100%. It means 17% of the time we're going to pull you out and you should would have been better off staying in. So, here in 2011, is that 
2011. Yes, it is. We got out of the market right there. Now, when we hit, because that's 5% below, when we hit 3% above, the market was up. So if you look at that, mm -hmm. we pulled you out there and we put you in back up there. Mm -hmm. So you, we took, took a loss on that. We, we, you didn't take a loss, you would have been better off staying in. But let me explain this to you. You're 60% stock. Let's say that that difference is a 5% difference. You missed out on 5% gain in the stock market. You own 60% of that. You missed out on 3%. Okay. So that's what it cost. We cost our clients 3%. We do not hide from that. Okay. But here's what it does do. That is the cost. That 3%, that is the cost that we must pay to catch every one of these drops. That's the cost it does. And we're willing to pay that cost. Because see, if we lose, if you guys lose 3% in your retirement, right. here, let me show you something, Dan. If you, let me go back to your spreadsheet here. Here's your nice graph. If we go out here and we lose 3%, or I'm gonna tell you what, I'm gonna retire you, and I'm gonna uh, have you lose 3%. Changed. Exactly. But let's say that you stayed in there. And you guys know you stayed in and got hammered that last time, right? Mm -hmm. And let's say that, you know, on average, the stock market, um, stock market has these uh, bear markets about every three or four years. On average, they're about a 30, 33% drop. Now, we know that in the last 15 years, we've had two of them. And we had a 49 and a 57. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you through and just say that, I mean, do you guys think that there's going to be another bear market between now and the day you die? Of course. I, I'm sure there will be. Okay. So what's going to happen Maybe here not is, before Jim dies. No, not before that's Jim. not like before I die. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> let's say that you were born under a lucky star and that you never go through another 49% or a 57%. But what you do is you only go through one, and it's a 30% drop. Right? And it's only one more. Look at what happens to your graph. Ooh. There you go. Look at what till you see where your biggest. See, what I'm about to show you is you're sitting there and you don't, I don't think you have what your biggest concern is. That's your biggest concern. Yes. That is if you go through one more bear market. Yeah, we can't do that. See, the, the predicament you're in is you can't do it, but you can't stay in cash. Because if you stay in cash, your graph looks like that too. Yeah. You have to kill their cash flow with a bear market. What they have to understand is, is that their biggest problem that they have is a bear market. So what you need to do is go in you had a nice picture that everything was rosy. Now you go in and put them through one bear market, and what's going to happen is, is they're going to run out of money before they run out of time. And now that they see this, you have to get them to agree that you're the solution to this problem, which they've already agreed is their main problem. So you have, to, you have to be in the market for some growth, right. but you have to have an exit strategy. That's why I told you earlier I thought you guys were perfect for us because we have the solution to solve what I see as your biggest problem. It's a bear market. And that's why, you know, from that standpoint, this is what, from the standpoint of what we do. I'm gonna You'd have to go get a job as a Walmart greeter. Oh, I don't want to do that. You know. I don't want to. And just made a statement. I made a mistake there in this present sta presentation. I should have just anchored Ann's statement and asked Jim, is that what you want me to do also? So the little things, I missed it in this one, and as I reviewed this, make sure that when, you, when Ann threw it out there, I should have anchored it. So do you have any questions if I sort of review, you know, and, and you see the problem that you have is that bear market, mm -hmm. right? We saw that biggest problem. Now, I have a fix. Well, that's what I'm wondering. Okay. Because you said they come every three and a half years. Well, you know, 
I am I, I am pretty good in math, and Andy, I know you're good in math, so it's statistics. But let me ask you a question. You look at that chart. Mm -hmm. Now, you see that chart when it went up and it's come down. It right. went up, it's come down, and it's went up. It looks like waves coming in on the beach. Okay, well, where's the next wave at coming down? Which way is that is, it looks like it's going to go? It's going to go down. And see, what you have to understand is where you guys are at right now is exactly where you were in 2008. You have not done anything different to change it. And the difference is, you're, and I believe that this is one of the reasons you're here, you're six years older. So, Jim, you were 51, yeah. and you were still 39 again, right? Right. But uh, what happened was, now that you're getting close to retirement, you have to protect this here. Absolutely. Let me sort of, sort of show you how to, to fix this. What we would do is we would open up three accounts. And you have an IRA. Jim, you have an IRA. And then you also have a joint account. Okay? Let me show you. And then a joint right of survivorship. And you get about 484000 And Jim, at years, you get about 352 And your joint account is about 115000 So what we would do is we would set up an IRA account for Ann, IRA account for Jim, and then what we would do is we would set up an account that was joint right of survivorship. Okay. And then what we would do is, is that you each would sign a transfer form, and we would send that to Fidelity, and then they would transfer this money over. This is how you make sure that that never happens. Just by moving the money over here, it would never happen? Well, with our exit strategy. Okay. Right now, you're out there, you're naked. Mm -hmm. What you went through in 2008, it, it could happen again. Right. Yeah, not could, it, it's just a matter of when. Okay. And the only reason it was okay is because I had more time to bounce back. Cause I, I bounced well, back. maybe. I don't think it's ever okay. Yeah. I don't think it's ever okay. Okay, I don't think it's so it's it's that's now you're probably more concerned about it because you have you know the, the cost of doing business with us, okay, because that generally is one that comes up. Yep, that's what I was thinking about. It's so all comes down to the cost. Okay, if you look at this, basically we have a set of managers that that are that we use that because we're not going to buy the stock, nor is anyone that you're sitting in front of buying stocks for you. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a company that we use called SEI uh, Private Trust. SEI is located in Oaks, Pennsylvania. They're part of the banking system and banking regulatory, so they're very similar to Fidelity or something like that. Mm -hmm. So theirs in a 60-40 portfolio is a little bit less than one percent is what they get paid. Our fees at what we do is we are one quarter of a percent per quarter. So let me explain how that's done. They take a snapshot of whatever your account balance is at the end of the quarter. So March 31st, June 30th. Mm -hmm. They multiply it by one quarter of a percent. That money gets debited against your account, and that's what gets debited, and that's what our fees are. So we're paying you one percent a year on our total assets. You're paying us 1% to manage your assets. Okay. Yes. E even when we're on the market? Yes. And actually, and the, that's a good point because you want me to do that. You want to pay me when I'm out of the market because if, if I wasn't getting paid when I'm out of the market, what am I going to do? I'm going to try to keep you in the market all the time. You'll be like our last guy. Yeah. He told us they to keep you in. Yeah. yeah. You know, mama needs a new pair of shoes, you know, and they're going to keep you in the market. So we're, this is an arm length. We can give you financial advice that we, matter of fact, I always say that the best decision we ever made, we moved our clients in 2008 to a 1% money market. So we guaranteed them by them sitting in that money market that they weren't going to make any money with us. But actually, that was one of the best decisions we ever made because of what transpired after that. Jim, I see you had written down some yeah, questions. Yeah, I had a few questions that I've, I've been thinking about. SEI, I'm not really sure who they are. Can you explain a little bit more? SEI, I, uh, I can have, a, have some brochures if you'd like to see it. But SEI is basically, you know, I have some people ask me what it stands for. I think it stands for a Simulated Environmental Integration. Let me explain who they are. 
SCI is actually a large uh, company, a large financial company. They were in, um, to begin with, back in the late 60s, they, they're a software writing company. They wrote softwares. Okay. And they wrote softwares for trust companies. Mm -hmm. At one time in the 70s, they probably had 95% of all the software in banks for trust companies. And then what they did is they finally figured in the 80s that what they could do is they could take all this information that they were creating on the trust side mm -hmm. and actually, you know, because they were doing it with large foundations and pension funds, and they were bringing it over and doing it for the retail person. Now, I use retail sort of loosely there because in order to be with them, you got to have 250 to play. So they're looking for the retail investor, but the higher end of it. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just not as familiar to me as, say, Fidelity is. Understood. And that, shouldn't that be a concern of mine? Well, it's, you know, I think what your main concern is, here's what you, I think what you're hitting here. You're hitting the Bernie Madoff question. Right. Which I would ask that, just, you know, Bernie Madoff. Yeah. Now, what Bernie Madoff did was he custodied the money. Okay. So when you wrote checks, you wrote check to Bernie Madoff. You'll never write a check to me or Money Matters. There's a separate trust company that SEI has that's held outside of our business and their business. I go back and explain Enron. If you, were in, uh, if you were an employee of Enron mm -hmm. and you had money in a 401k right. and none of it was in Enron stock, mm -hmm. did you lose any money when Enron went under? The answer is no, because your money was held separately outside away from the firm. Oh, okay. All right. Does that make sense to you, Anne? I, it does. Okay. So regardless, up or down, I think Ann talked about it a little bit, but I just want to clear up my head. It's 1% of our million dollars. Yes. Close to your million. Yes. Well, it's 1%. Right. And, and that just comes out of our account? You don't bill us? or No, it comes out of your account on a, a one quarter of a percent every quarter. You've, you've asked that question now three times. I want you really to put it in perspective. Last time when you went down in your 401k and mm -hmm. your and your IRAs, right. okay, and it works two ways. You're still not in the market because of the money that was lost, mm -hmm. and you lost a lot of money. Sure. Okay. You lost over 30% mm -hmm. that, that year. Yeah. Our clients did not lose any money that year. Okay. So okay. Yeah. That right there, that one year would have mm -hmm. paid me for the rest of my life. And since the, we got back in the market in June here, we're probably up 16, 30, we're probably up 36% since we got back in the market. So we would have paid all your fees for the rest of our life. Okay. You know what I'm showing you here, guys, I'm showing you, I'm showing you sort of the science. There's a lot of art that goes involved in here too. A lot of art that we go in, and that's where I talk about the five partners talking about all the art that we create. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, being married to an engineer, we never make snap decisions. You're not expecting us to do this today, are you? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I, you know, do you have any specific questions that, that pertain to this? I think he's done a pretty good job of explaining it. I think we yeah. just need to think about it a little what bit. What I want to do is, if you don't mind, because I've been drinking coffee, and I'm going to go out and grab something and go to, go to the restroom, and let me go ahead and, and come back in a couple of minutes if you don't mind, okay? I'll just excuse sure. myself. All right, thank you. And you guys, while I'm gone, talk amongst yourself if you okay. would. Here, I'm leaving the room. And the reason is, is during my me meeting, we've come to the decision, or we've come to the point where it's time for them to make a decision on whether or not they want to become clients. I felt that they needed to talk about it. They're not gonna talk openly with me in the room. So as you can see here, I asked to be excused that I needed to go to the little boy's room. Why? Because that was the point in time that they needed to talk to each other. And what you'll listen here is you'll listen that I left the room and sure enough, they talk amongst themselves. And then when I came back in the room, they were able to make a decision. Well, you have because you haven't lost anything. Now I've gone up and down. 
probably I can really see the value of coming closer together on that. What I realized though that I could have made a lot more mm -hmm. if I had it in the market than just sitting on the <sighs> Much better. Good. What, uh, the, uh, one thing is is that, uh, Jim, you had brought up something. I know you guys have brought up fees a couple times mm -hmm. and stuff. One thing I wanted to sort of show you, which I'm not sure if you realize this, a lot of people don't. Let me just show you a typical, um, I don't know, Fidelity, dis I'm not sure if you're in the Discovery Fund at all. I think we have a little of that. Remember the old Magellan Fund from Fidelity? Because I think what you have to realize is, you know, you're over at Fidelity, and you are paying fees inside their funds. Do you? Were you familiar with that? Okay, I, I, told you I that. don't think I remember that. Okay. How would I know what it is? Well, what we can do is it's public information, okay. or actually, what you should do, you should have a prospectus. Now, you ever read your prospectus? Yeah, I, yeah, I know. I never read a prospectus either. But let's say it's a, uh, for instance, the Fidelity. I know one of the popular one, popular ones they like is the Equity Income Fund. Yeah. So to give you sort of an idea, on the Fidelity Equity Income Fund, see it comes up. So you're paying a fee to them of about 0.64%. Let me explain year. the difference. Every year, that's coming. That's a 0.64% is what it costs you to be in that account. What happens you is... Know that? I, I was not aware of that. It's actually taken away from your return. So the difference here is we, if let's say that you made 10%, mm -hmm. well, we're going to make 11%, take 1% away, and give you 10. Here what they're doing is you're doing 10.64%. And they're taking their 0.64 away from your returns and you're never seeing it. Does SEI do that? SEI is, from their returns, they do the same thing, but as I described before. But a lot of people believe that they're not made, paying any fees where they're at. Right. And I just wanted to bring up that there is a fee in there okay. that you're paying. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. I don't think I do that. Now, is there any questions that you have that when I... Since I left, when I came back. No, I guess the only other thing that came up is we've been with this broker for a while. And I don't know if he's doing the greatest job or not, but I kind of feel loyal to him. Should I, I'm wondering if we should take this to him and let him look at it, get his opinion. Now, is he the same guy you were with during 2008? Yes, and I did call him several times. I was a little nervous as it started going down. He talked to me about just staying in because I hadn't lost any money. I didn't really understand that because it seemed like I was, but what's your take you on know, that? You know, I have to tell you a story. I like telling stories. I'll tell you a story. So I was sitting here with a client. They're clients now, but I was sitting here, and what happens is is that they, uh, about this time, this is when Ann would look over at you. This is when his mm -hmm. wife looked over and said, you know, what are you having trouble with? And she's like, well, we've been with this other guy for like 15 years. Right. We've, we, don't, we go in and we don't even talk about investment sometimes. We talk about our kids. And it's like we've raised our kids together. Mm -hmm. And she turned to him and she said, is this what we need to protect our future? This, does this make sense to you? And he goes, well, yeah, but, the, you know, it's a close friend. Yeah. And she said, well, this is what we need to do. I will make the phone call. <laughs> so... Okay. You know, I think what you have to decide is, you know, going back on this graph, what I fear for you is that you do the same thing over and over again, and that what happens is you do go through that bear market again, and when that bear market happens, you are doing what you alluded to earlier, Ian. Okay? Let me show you what, you're, what we're talking about here. This is, this is that bear market. And okay, guess what? Don't change that. Okay, go ahead, but don't change the slide. I want to ask a question. Go ahead and ask right now. Okay, so you're saying that if we were here, you, your math would have not allowed us to do this. You would have got out way up here. Okay. And there's a solution to this, okay? Let me explain what the solution is. I think this will fix it. 
I do believe this. I think this will fix it. Yeah, it runs it out. It runs it out to 95. Let me, I'll, I, if you go through a bear market, here's what we have to do to get you back fixed. There you go. Now, what did we just do? So we just can't afford a bear market. No, it, it appears we cannot. What I just did there was to fix this so you don't run out of money. I took, I, I decreased your cost of living by five hundred dollars, which you say, you know, I think we can do. I took away all your vacations. Oh, we didn't want that in retirement. I took away all your vac, but that's what you're going to have to do. That's what happens with a bear market. What I did here is, is I took away their dream. Once they were still trying to make a decision about whether or not to use us, what I did here was I told them if they went through one more bear market, what they, I did was I told them that we could fix this problem, a bear market. And how did we do it? Because I took away all their travel and their travel is their dream. So when you're doing a closing interview and you have the cash flow up there, you know what's most important to them. And a bear market, if you take away their dreams, that really hits home. Well, it makes sense to not do that again. I'll make the call. <laughs> you make the call. Okay, so going back over here, is there any yeah. reason that we, we shouldn't get started on the paperwork today? How do you feel? I, I, honestly, I'm ready to just move my money over. I, I don't know if you feel the same way, Jim, but... Um, I'm, I'm ready to sign the paper. Well, although we've invested differently, we've always done things together as a family. I'm, I'm in. Good. Uh, I'm going to go get the paperwork. I'm going to add one thing. Um, you know, we're going to be moving you to a 60-40. Right. And since you're in cash right now, I want to address that a little bit. Since you're in cash, I don't like taking a person who has $448,000 in cash and sticking them all in the market at the same time. So what I'm going to suggest that we do is that we dollar cost average. Now what dollar cost averaging means is I'm going to take a fourth of your money and put it in the 60% stock, 40% bond. And then uh, 30 days later, I'm going to do it again and 30 days later. So it'll take four months to get your money into the market. Well, I was thinking though that with the market being down a little bit right now. That it's down a little bit, but it's not down a lot. And here's what I would do is do it for, let me explain what we would do. Let's say that we go through a 5%, 7% correction between now and four months. So let's say it happens in two months, okay? Market goes down 5%. We only have half your money in. I'm going to put your name right next to this list here of other people who only have half their money in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call you up and say, hey, Ann, now's a good time to dump the rest of it in. Okay. Okay. That's what our, that's what we're doing as a firm. As a firm, we're advising people. Now, Jim, not you, yeah. because you're all in already. Okay. But Ann, I just want to make sure that we we verify that. Okay. You're okay. good with that. Yeah. Okay. I'll be right back. Or right, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you out to Molly, and Molly will help you with the paperwork. Sounds okay. good. But I have one other question. Can I ask you this one real quick? Yes. When I sell out, am I selling everything to come over here? Yes. So why would that well, be a tax consequence of doing that? Well, I looked at your joint return. Okay. okay. First of all, from your IRAs, the answer is no. Okay. Okay. Now your joint account is more of a sixty forty. That's a smaller account. Anyway. It's a hundred fifteen thousand. So there's not, not much in it. Big deal. Yeah. If there was a, a tax consequence, we would tell you that. Okay. Let's say that there was a tax consequence. Let's say I would have brought that up to you, okay. but we would have had to make that decision. Because one thing that we don't want to do is we don't want to have the tax tail wagging the investment dog. Right. So even though you may have some capital gains built up, we have to decide, you know, if you go through a, a bear market, it's, you, we, can, we, can, we can come and get them then because you'll lose all your money. Yeah. And then you will, there will not be any gains. Yeah. I'd rather, you know, it reminds me of uh, Warren Buffett. They asked Warren Buffett. What's the secret to having so much money? You know what he said? I've always sold too soon. I've always, I've never been greedy, never tried to hit the highs. I've always sold too soon. So if you did have a large taxable gain there, we would have addressed it. But if it's long-term capital gains, I'd rather, you know, take my profits than stay in there and, and get or have losses. I think that answers it for me. Anything else? Nope, I think we're good. You're good? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for your time.